The recording is now in progress. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm super excited to be um, back here with the lovely Emma. I know that the email we sent out said Natalie, so I hope no one will be disappointed that it's me and Bridge today. Uh, so I've got Emma and Bridget joining us today. Um, and our topic for today is what makes a great coach. Um, and we're looking at communication today. So you gotta move, you gotta move your feet, people. All right, so before we begin, I would like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we meet today and their continuing connection to the land, waters and communities of Australia. We pay our respects to them and to their elders past, present and emerging. And we also pay respect to everyone on the line, to your ancestors as well. Um, and I like to acknowledge that I'm standing on Woodjack land of the Noongar people. Okay, so what is in store for you today? So on our agenda today, um, we're looking at stories, research questions from the book specifically around communication. Um, and this is always one of those topics where I think lots of people think um, that they're really excellent at communicating. And it's one of those ones where you really, it's one of those things that even as good as you are at communicating, the refinement of it is always really important. Um, as always, this is all about creating community, creating shared learning experience, thought-provoking conversations, and your CCEUs will be available at the end of the session. Um, and as we go through, if you want to pop something in chat, we are, absolutely want to hear from everybody. If you've got questions, if you've got additional bits to add to it, please do so. Looks like we've got Sydney, Sydney's joined in, Coffs Harbour, that sounds nice, Denver, Brisbane. I said, Sherry, I'm in WA here and I wasn't talking about the weather for some of our, our Melbourne friends. But anyway, here we go. Um, so, Emma, it is so lovely to have you back again. Um, it, and we're exploring the top as we explore the top 10 practices of what makes a great coach. I don't know if you know, but it's been just over a month since you launched the book. You've probably counted down the minutes and the days. Um, can you share with us what have been the highlights for you since you um, since the book was launched? So thank you, Paula, for uh, first of all, having me on your coaching podcast again, and of course for, to Bridge as well. Uh, so I definitely would say that the highlight for me was the weekend that we launched on the Sunday, I had an in-person book launch here in Denver, Colorado. And I, it, I've i even thrown it out here early on this podcast to, to put both Paula and Bridget, maybe Paula could fly in from WA, but I, I can't wait to have one in Melbourne as well, just in case anyone wants to fly down from Coffs or, or Sydney <laughs> for Watch this space, maybe end of November. But my in-person book launch, I gamified the whole book launch. I didn't do a probably what called a traditional book launch, as in I had everyone in the audience have to meet somebody, have to find somebody who's a coach. They had to ask them what their what their strength was as a you know as a person and what them what they thought makes a great coach. And then I put it into a big pot and drew out prizes every 10 minutes based on all of the 10 practices wow. so people were like this is like a game show and for me it was like I couldn't have I, I couldn't think of a better way to launch a book and the, the photos from a professional photographer who is one of my close friends who I said oh do you mind taking some pictures I didn't know that she was a professional photographer <laughs> so long story short she took some images they are amazing I can't wait to to share them this week no doubt on social media and <laughs> share them with the open door uh, alumni as well but just the the energy of 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 having people there that resonated with the book liked the content enjoyed the simplicity of the format and all the things that Natalie and I wanted people to feel even the storytelling of my journey for people to come and say oh I had no idea even even my mum said she had no idea when I was <laughs> facing that semi-trailer head on in Florida, uh, searching my dreams. So that's definitely been the highlight. And uh, I can't wait to have another one in Melbourne when I come back. I'm sorry for my childlike enthusiasm 
for wanting to come back to Australia, but it's been three years. So um, that's where I'm at, Paula. <laughs> Amazing. And I probably should have introduced you as Emma Doyle, Amazon number one bookseller, you know, <laughs> bookselling author, a number one author. How amazing is that? That That is something I think I'm still uh, sinking into. And it's it's for me, it's it's because of the team that's put together and because of the amazing um, open door support community obviously natalie ashdown who's who's doing some amazing work with air force uh why she can't join us today but it, it's to me it's it's i don't know i don't I, I haven't yet i don't know whether yet i feel that i'm i'm more about thank goodness for the team and i'm very very grateful and and just feel so humbled uh to hear those words mm -hmm. Well, well speaking of Natalie, she did say she is working with Air Force in Queensland today and couldn't be here, but she just wanted to let everyone know what her highlight had been. And it was really the number of people who've reached out to her and talked to her about bits in the book that really resonated with them um, and connecting with a lot of old friends in the coaching community. So people, you know, talking to her and saying, that bit in the book, I really loved that bit and here's how it worked for me. Um, and all those old contacts that you don't necessarily hear from all the time and then all of a sudden there's a reconnection and it's almost like finding little treasures in your, in your cupboard that you didn't know were in there. Um, and she just wanted to let everyone know that she really appreciates um, everyone who's read the book um, and she suggested that everyone who read the book should go onto Amazon and write a review um, and let everyone else know how amazing it is. Mm. I couldn't couldn't agree more. Hey Paula, oh. do you want to stop sharing your screen so that um, I can see your beautiful smile? And same with Bridget's. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's a that's a much better view, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so Emma, the chapter on communication starts with a rather jarring story. Move, move, move you. You've got to move your feet. Can you tell us um, about how about that story to kick us all off? Yeah, well, one, one thing that I that I love to do, and I still love to do it, and I think I will do this for the for the rest of my life, but I love watching other coaches coach. Even in the early part of the book, you'll hear my journey around how I just wanted to learn the look. So I would be traveling and stretching my comfort zone to just throw myself in positions where I was like, do I see what they see? And then 10 years pass, 20 years pass, and and so there's a fascination that I've always had with coaching. I could be taking a dog for a walk. I could be exercising, going on a run. But if someone's coaching, and especially in my chosen sport of tennis, I love stopping and just listening and hearing uh, how coaches are communicating with players. Because as we know, so many of, of the world's best coaches have said that communication is so important. And... Uh, I, I'm fascinated and, and, and equally, I put the disclaimer out there that I don't always know the background behind what I'm watching, okay? So I don't necessarily know the background of the player. But what I do know is the number of coaches that give continuous directive commands like move your feet, you've got to take that racket back, turn, turn earlier, come on. So I love the passion. I love the enthusiasm. And while there's no one way to coach, I find that that style of coaching is very, very common, especially in the sports coaching world. And the story is for me, and the reason why I love to watch other coaches coach is because it, when I got off the tennis court, and I know we're probably going to touch on that later in one of your questions, but I just, but when I, when I really learned from the open door coaching methodology that there was there was a whole nother world of not filling in the space continuously, not just because I'm a subject matter expert, not having to continuously talk or use directive commands or inspire somebody just by yelling and telling. When I found out there was a whole nother way of coaching, I was really, really uh, um, excited about that. So that story is almost a summary of so many times in my life where I was like, oh, I wonder if that's, I wonder A, if the student is hearing, I wonder B, if the message is getting through, and I wonder C, 
especially under pressure, if that student can retain any of what the coach is with, with the best intentions, uh, trying to communicate. And I use the word, I never use the word try when I'm coaching, but I feel like the coach is trying to communicate. And it's almost like the parent listening to the coach and then the parent says, don't you remember what your coach said last week in the lesson <laughs> when they're reflecting on the match? So I think the story is very common. It does make my heart a little, I, my heart bleeds a little bit for often the student. And granted, I don't always know the situation in the background. Uh, so I do put that disclaimer out there, which I think is important as well. I'm not saying my way or the highway, but I am saying that it happens way too frequently, especially in the sports coaching world. Uh, and that's the opening story. Yeah. Uh, can I just add to just make a comment to you about what you've just said there? Um, and regardless of what the story is behind that, and I know you've made that disclaimer, but essentially, as soon as you raise your voice and you start telling and you're dictating or, or um, you've got that, that huge amount of energy going into um, the brashness of it, you get that person who's immediately going to close up. So, of course, he's not going to remember what his coach said the week before. So, unless it's that open and curious you know, open and curious um, comments, then they're not going to be open to it. So, yeah, it does. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yep. I completely agree. And and even uh, Tennis Australia, you know, I'm so grateful to them for the 10 years that I was coaching coaches how to coach. And we would have to, on day one, demonstrate the differences between the two styles and then have coaches reflect on how it made them feel. And even as a coach, and you think about even working in America, Australia, even you know, Western culture, uh, there's no doubt that uh, that style of learning isn't the way of the future. It's not how kids learn. It's not the way that people now that were kids of even Generation X, for example, are now in the workplace. It's not how they're learning. And that's why uh, I'm also really grateful. One of the coaches who I mentioned in this book, um, Paula and Bridge, is uh, Emma um, uh, Ber Bergic Bucko. And she's from Bosnia. She was an exceptional tennis player. Of course, I have the book in my hands right here, I know, just in case anyone was wondering. Uh, but she's, imagine growing up in Eastern, Eastern Europe um, she's a huge tennis influencer. And on the podcast, she said, a great coach must have a connection with the, for the communication to be a two-way street. As a coach, you need to constantly ask questions and be curious. Even though she's a seven-time All-American, she grew up with an instructional style of coaching. Mm -hmm. She understands the importance of balancing communication. So it's super awesome. And she's a young game changer. So I love also that the book has not only famous coaches, many people you know, wouldn't have heard of her necessarily. So, uh, but she's in there because she's someone who's come from that style and recognizes the importance of what we're, of what we're talking about. So I just wanted to, to throw that one in there. Yeah, I think there were two really important things in there. One is that you watch other coaches and I actually, it's one of my favorite things to do. I'm not necessarily watching sports coaches, although I've got lots of feedback I'd like to give the Freeman on Dockers coaches and the like because they're my team. Um, but I love to watch Natalie coach. I love to watch Bridget coach. I love to watch lots of other people coach because the things that you pick up, you, everyone has such a distinctive style when they, they're moving through it and you hear words that you might not use but really resonate that you'd like to use. Mm. So I think from that coach development piece, actually listening and watching other coaches is a really critical thing to be doing, just seeing what other people are doing. Um, the other is that if you go into any workplace, there are directive managers all over the place <laughs> who are still following that same, I'm going to tell you what to do and I may even yell it. Um, and I'm going to, and I'm just going to keep repeating myself until you figure out what it is I'm trying to say. Um, which I think is exactly what you're saying in regards to the yeah. tennis court. It, I think it plays out in the workforce as well. Okay, well, that's really interesting to hear uh, from both of you who are living and breathe it. Obviously, I'm transitioning from the sports world into the corporate world. 
Uh, and even I just finished another leaders coach course today. And there were still some of the questions that were coming up and people were like, yeah, but what about if I've got a really great solution and I can give it to them in two minutes and they're paying me a lot of money to give them the answer. So Bridget, what's, what's your take on how would you have answered yeah. that question that I, I asked today? Thank you. No, I think as a coach, uh, I think the minute you offer your opinion or your advice or what I've done before is the minute you take away that learning opportunity for that person. So from the coach, my gift to you is to allow you to consider it for yourself and stretch your thinking because I know that you have the answer. Even if you don't think you do right now, I know through asking you some really open and curious questions, you'll be able to find some way of finding that answer, whether it's a resource or a support or something that allows you to find that, that answer. So, um, and I'm not suggesting uh, that, that mentoring and consulting and those sorts of things obviously have their place, but if you're coaching, not for a second would I do that. I would, I would know that, that, you know, that's my gift as a coach to you to, to allow you to do that. As my gift as a coach. Oh, why couldn't we put that line in the book, Bridget? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really important. Um, yeah, I think it's a really important point that I might have an opinion, I might know something from experience, I might have, uh, you know, what have you, but that doesn't mean that that's the right answer for you. Um, it may be an answer, but uh, I know that you're going to feel so much more fulfilled when you find it out for yourself than hearing, yeah, yeah. you know, what I say. Mm. But version two, I think I'm going to add, I've just written that one down. I hope everyone else has too. So, Bridget, whenever you ask why you're here, that's the reason that you are here. Um, I could say something else, too. I, I, I was thinking about the, the whole telling and what have you, and I think it's important also to, for us to remember, you know, Emma mentioned, you know, how do you take on that learning with that, with that yelling? But also, too, I think it's important to recognise what our learning styles or our learning preferences are as well. It's not just about that, you know, that auditory, you know, hearing people tell you all the time, telling you over and over again. So, you know, um, what is someone's learning preference? You know, do they want to see something? Do you need to show them something? Do they need to try something on? Are they highly kinesthetic or visual? Um, do they need to process that information, auditory, digital? Um, so taking into account who's standing in front of us and how do I serve that person in the best possible way? And how do I connect and communicate with them apart from just telling them something? regardless of the tone, you know, there might be other, other ways of, of um, communicating with them. Mm. Yeah, and I guess living in the coaching world that we do in, in that workplace and business coaching space, that's one of the key things that you learn really early on. So, Emma, do you think in the sporting, in, in the tennis world and the sporting world, that that is one of the things that they could learn that is the one one of the key areas for them is that understanding the different learning styles understanding the different communication styles and then and coaching from that perspective 100 percent. so i mean i can't even begin to tell you so two quick stories around that that really impacted my journey one was when i was a really early learning facilitator i met a gentleman who's in the book called mitchell hewitt mitch hewitt and he just really helped me as a learning facilitator in coaching coaches how to coach, understand the difference between, uh, in, a, in, in the tennis term, we call it direct and indirect. So in the book, especially from a workplace perspective, uh, Natalie and I describe direct as instructional and indirect as coach E-centered, coach E-centered. Uh, so... If you think about instructional, those coaching style of communication be often interchangeably with terms like directing, telling, explicit, teacher-centered, prescriptive, command, and control. And the other way that I like, I love to think about it, like really to, to simplify it, is who's making the decisions within the learning environment, whether that be a, a business coaching, a sports coaching, a tennis coaching situation. So I really love that as compared to if we look at the coach E-centered communication style can often be used interchangeably with terms like collaborative, partnering, guiding, discovery, inquiry, and questioning, which again relates to who's making the decision within the session. 
if the if the students or the client is making the decision or the team member is making the decision within the communication style that's coach e centered so i just think that's a good um, clarification and Mitch Hewitt helped he's the first person that helped me understand the difference between the two and then it was Natalie Ashdown that just I want to say just gave me a big you know <laughs> like that but she did right but she asked me to to run a session with uh, one of my close friends and and who's an amazing person Erin uh, Redden we were partnering in this in this role play situation and she told me that I wasn't allowed to give one directive command I had to only ask questions for the entire session so that was my biggest aha moment around the two different styles and in the tennis world we say it's not one versus the other okay in the sport in the sports coaching sense what Natalie and I describe in the book though is that while it's not one versus the other most sports coaches live permanently on the on the instructional style. So can sports coaches and tennis coaches, back to your original question, Paula, can they learn from the business community? 100,000% yes. Mm. And as Bridget alluded to, can they then adapt their communication style based on the learning preference and based even on your own community, the way that you naturally like to communicate as a human? Uh, 100 thousand percent and it, and that takes years of practice mm -hmm. and it's not something you just pick up overnight but it starts with conscious awareness mm -hmm. and I still even as running my leader as coach course today and um you know it's it runs over two days as you know it's it's open doors methodology I picked I picked up my own language three times and I called myself out as a learning facilitator in the program to highlight my language of how I made an unforced error around a question or around a reframing of a word like but uh, when I negated every positive someone had said accidentally, subconsciously. So I was bringing that up as because it's so in my conscious awareness mm -hmm. around how uh, I can do a better job as we all can do a better job. So yes, the, my and can I just say also my favorite part of the book honestly is how sports coaches and tennis coaches can learn from the business co coaching community and how the business coaches can learn from the passion and the and the uh the the purpose and the decision making and the belief part of the sports coach which the sports coach has so that's probably one of my my favorite overarching concepts of the book so did I answer your question Paula uh, you sure did and about um I don't, I don't like I don't know 15 years ago or something I introduced a leadership program into a organization that had that was very sports minded um, and we called it every manager is a coach um, and, the, and the first bit was if you talked about your team on a Monday morning and their performance of last week as much as you talked about your sporting team, it would be a really great place to start. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I, I actually, I agree. I think there are some absolutely beautiful links between the business world and sporting and that the sharing of that knowledge and leveraging off the strengths mm. of each one can, can really propel um, each side. So um, unless anyone has, does anyone on the line have any specific questions for Emma at this stage? Well, so I love the, um, the use of, you said unforced error, but there's the I love that, yeah. yeah. It just comes naturally, doesn't it, in a, in a speak. Um, so, yeah. But I think yeah, the, the, that behavioural flexibility to, to take uh, what we know as workplace coaches and what you know as a sports coach and you know you're pulling out all those parts to serve that person in front of you you know how do I serve that person the best possible way what do they need right now um, you know and it could be a balance it could be it could be that you're purely coaching you know what is the agreement between that between that um, that relationship those two people in that relationship um, whether they need a bit of guidance and mentoring and what have you, or is it a purely a coaching session? And like that person that you mentioned before, Emma, what would you do in that situation? You know, what is the role that that person's playing in that relationship? 
so in terms of the response that they might give. All right, so just to finish this off, I would like to ask both Emma and Bridget um, what your your top key tips are for working working on practicing your communication. Mm. You go right, through. I'll, I'll kick it off. It would have to be, uh, I'm, I'm going to refer to practice eight, curiosity. So number one, if I'm super curious and I'm going to learn about your developmental needs. Uh, so once I've got that under my belt, then I'd say tap into uh, practice seven, listening. The more we can enhance that listening so that then tap into the practice that we're talking about tonight, which is practice nine, adapt your communication. Because my biggest aha moment came when I when I removed myself off a tennis court and I realized I had to change my communication to bring out the best in somebody else rather than, hey, you know, come with me and I'll I'll make you better. It was not about that. So they're my three top tips around how I would I would go about I'd go about that. So my top three tips would be, I agree with you in terms of the curiosity. Uh, I think that's really, really important because then I, I get rid of everything that's going on in here and my assumptions and my judgment and my, I know what I think. I'm letting all of that go because I want to know what you think. So curiosity, 100% agree with that. Um, I'm going to add, so I'm going to join you there. Um, the, the other one that I would say is um, being open. So our open questions because that aligns with curiosity you know the who the what the where when how you know those open and curious sentence starters and the third one would be something every day do something every day listen every day choose a way of approaching a conversation every day just decide every day so then you start to build your skill set and then it becomes part of how you operate and how you approach people. So it's it's conscious awareness, it's something every day to build on that skill and that ability to communicate effectively. Mm. And, don't, and don't just take it from Bridget and I. Of course, you love the, I've got the book on hand here, Paula. Yeah. I just have to say, <laughs> let me just turn to the actual page. Uh, so who else do we have? Uh, we've got Gigi Fernandez, Justine Hennon, uh, used to form a number of the word. Our very own Casey Delacqua does lots of commentating on the Aussie Open. Um, Jules Hay, she's a, a she's a AFLW um, women's coach. Uh, Lisa Stone, she's a parent coach here in the USA. Michelle Clear, she's a sports psychologist in California. Jay Gruden, he's an NFL coach. Uh, Nick Volateri, Tony Palafox, a former coach of John McEnroe, and Anne Pankhurst is one of the biggest and best known. Uh, educators of tennis globally for the PTR. They mm. all said, what makes a great coach? Communication. Yeah, beautiful. Amazing. And for anybody who has not yet purchased a copy of this amazing book, um, you can scan the QR code um, and purchase it in whichever country you are calling in from. Um, and I highly recommend that you do. It is um, well worth a read. It's super practical. It's super easy to read. And you are thinking, it just makes you think the whole way through, which is amazing. Um, some of the programs coming up for Open Door, um, if you are wanting to learn more in this space, we've got our Diploma of Organisational Coaching. Our, cert for, our next Cert for in Workplace and Business Coaching will be next year. We have our mental health first aid training coming up in December um, and our leader as coach program, which, as Emma mentioned, um, sits over a couple of days and we do it as a, um, an online program. Well, I would like to thank, oh, sorry, Emma. Before you do, I was just going to say I've got a, um, the equivalent in America, the Cert for in Workplace and Business Coaching. So I have one called a High Performance Workplace Coaching Certification. It's the exact same uh, open door methodology and we have it coming up on the 5th of November. So we've got one more. For, uh, yeah. Perfect. I would like to thank Emma and Bridget. Um, I always learn so much when you guys um, join me. So thank you so very much. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us on the line. I'm going to finish up here and then I'll just make sure I have, yeah, I'm going to finish the recording.
Um, and then anyone who wants to take a photo of the CCEUs can. Um, so enjoy your whichever day of the week it is for you <laughs> at whatever time of the day that it is for you. Um, and we will see you next week. Um, and thank you for joining us today.